everyone, and welcome to the show. We are so glad you're with us today. Well, we all deal with worry, and at times it can really take over and even get out of control. Yeah, well, high schooler Faith Eilertson experienced this firsthand. And right now, she shares a personal message of encouragement on how we can overcome our worries. Did you know worry was a sin? A little while back, I went through a period of time where worry just really took over my life and my actions. I was so afraid that someone in my family would die or hardship would come that I just let this worry begin to take over my mind. Growing up, my dad's a Marine, so he would leave on deployments, and my fear wasn't too serious, but just the thought of my dad will leave and never came back just lingered in the back of my mind. But it began to get serious in seventh grade around Christmas time when there was a freak accident and my brother's best friend died. It was so scary and heartbreaking seeing the people I love and the community I lived in go through such a tragic loss. And it was scary knowing that somebody so close to you could die so suddenly. And this worry began to build up inside of me, but it didn't come out until about half a year later when my grandma passed away. I was going in eighth grade and it was around the fall time and she got sick and suddenly passed. It was very hard because my grandma and I were super close and this worry began to just take over. It took over my mind, my actions, my thoughts, what I did, what I let myself do. My dad would leave for work and I'd be so scared that he'd get in a car accident or I'd say goodnight to my mom, go upstairs and literally cry myself to sleep because I was so scared she wouldn't wake up again. And this went on for about five months longer and it was just constant fear and anxiety that I would lose someone else I loved. So I joined the worship team at my church. I began to realize how good God was and I wanted to experience that for myself. I spent time in the Word, spent time in prayer, and really just did everything I could to grow my relationship. And I found comfort every time I went and worshiped and saying I found comfort knowing God's in control. I could give Him this worry that I had been dealing with for so long. He cared for me and He is willing to take that. I could cast this burden on Him. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. This was so encouraging to me in this time because I knew I could give Him this burden that I had been carrying for so long, and He was willing to take it from me. Yes, I still struggle sometimes with worry, but I let Him take control in those times of needs, and I turn to Him in prayer. So I just encourage anyone who struggles with the same thing, whether it's serious or small, just know God's in control and He has the master plan. He is the King of Kings and He knows what's next, so we don't have to worry about it. So I just encourage you to give it to God and turn to Him in this time of need. Well, Faith, you encourage us today. You certainly do have a lot of wisdom for a very young person. You know, we all worry, don't we? I don't, I don't think I have to convince you that we go through stages where we worry, we have these anxious thoughts. Some of us deal with them often. Sometimes it's just kind of seasonal. I've certainly dealt with this anxiety and worry and we worry about what people think of us. We worry about some tragedy striking, all these things. But she brought up that verse in 1 Peter 5, cast your cares on him. That's God. That's who Peter's talking about because he cares for you. When that was first written, the translation meant because you are of concern to him. And how do we know this? We know this because of Jesus, because God, who Peter's referring to, cast your cares on him, sent his son. Here's the amazing thing to me in that verse, that Jesus desires we cast our cares on him. God desires that we look to his son and cast our cares. It's hard to find people in life that want to share our concerns and our pain and our anxiety. It is, isn't it? We have a God who wants us to bring these concerns and fears and anxious thoughts to him. Sometimes it's hard to wrap our heads around that, that we are free and encouraged to bring these fears and worries to God. Jesus in, in Matthew, I think it's Matthew five or six, five, it's Matthew six, I believe, five times Jesus says, do not worry. It's like a command, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. You cannot add a single hour to your life by worry. What's he mean by that? It's of no benefit to you to worry. Sometimes it's like we feel like we have to worry because it shows we're responsible. It shows that we have a plan to make. Jesus wants us to rest in him. My favorite scripture, one of them, John 14, 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And when we receive a gift, we have to open it. We have to engage with 
the giver. And, and Jesus says, this is a peace not like the world gives. Do not be troubled or afraid. Now, I have found in life it's very difficult to worry and worship, to worry and meditate on God's love. Sometimes that's easier said than done, right? Because these things are on our heart. But I have found, and it's taken me a long time to find it, that when I'm in prayer, when I'm seeking God, when I'm telling God how much I think of Him, it's more difficult to think about my worries and concerns. And, and just one final note, this idea of casting our cares upon God, it's not, you know, a lot of times we think of casting, it's like fishing, right? We throw it out there, but we bring it back. We do that so many times with our worries. And in, in the biblical sense here, casting is, is throwing it, it's flinging it, it's distancing ourselves from it. It's an act of will, and Jesus does not want us to take it back on. So if you'd like an additional resource on this and how to prayerfully meditate on the scripture and seek freedom from anxiety, I am telling you there is hope in the gospel of Jesus. And if you're a Christian and you're saying, why am I struggling with worry? Why am I struggling with anxious thoughts? We live in a fallen world and a lot comes at us and there are a lot of distractions. So we need to stay grounded in Jesus. We wanna send you a resource that'll help you do that. It's a free resource sheet. It's called Freedom From Anxiety. I encourage you to download a free copy at cbn.com or you can give us a call 800-700-7000 and we will send it to you. Freedom From Anxiety, God's power for you and your family. So please give us a call. Well, extremist groups are targeting teenagers for recruitment with a popular form of entertainment. They're using video games to lure troubled teens. CBN's Brody Carter talked with a former radical gamer who brings us this warning for families. It's highly likely you or a family member have played video games. They've become so popular that an estimated 216 million Americans consider themselves gamers. That's more than half the country's population. And today's video games are a far cry from Pong and Pac-Man, for better and for worse. I'm currently actually looking at the darker sides of games and how games are being leveraged for radicalization and the mobilization of radical networks. We could tell somebody to make a Nazi game on Roblox, let alone one of such expanse. Alex Newhouse and Dr. Rachel Coert are behind a groundbreaking study on the evolution of gaming and the platform's growing use to promote extreme ideologies and radicalization. I personally focus mostly on the far right and it appears that the far right is the most interested in using game platforms, but jihadists, Islamists, like they also engage with, with, um, with gaming platforms. They try to recruit teens and adolescents. It's a very small group of people, but it's a very powerful group of people. For those who believe they or their kids are safe from extreme propaganda, the Anti-Defamation League has found close to one in four people are exposed to white supremacist ideologies on the internet. That's about 54 million Americans. It was so shocking to me that the number was, it was 23%. I was like, it can't be 23%. Like that is so high, how is that possible? So shocking, it became the catalyst for Cohort and Newhouse to dive into the research in order to raise awareness. One aspect behind this trend is the combining of video games with streaming platforms or social networking apps. Discord and Twitch, which aren't games, those are called you know, we refer to those as gaming adjacent platforms. And then things like Minecraft and Roblox, which have some sort of interactivity, those are games. Given this overlap, players can stream live gaming sessions or connect with complete strangers through chats and forums, which can be great, but also dangerous. Games were created as games first and social platforms second, but the problem is that the growth of games as kind of social networking spaces has exponentially outpaced the rate at which the gaming industry has kept up with their moderation. Discord, a social media platform for gamers, was specifically identified in 2020 as a hub and community for right-wing extremism. In Europe, the country's counterterrorism coordinator doubling down on that warning, saying extremists are increasingly present in digital gaming spaces. They shouldn't be leaving the game with strangers, just like you wouldn't leave the park with a stranger. If somebody's saying, hey, why don't you leave this gaming space and come join me and these other people you don't know on a third party server, that's usually a red flag, especially for younger children. Even so, Rachel points out the research finds there are game spaces that provide more good than bad. She adds there is a darkness, however, which is why she and her colleague are working to make games a safer place. I was a former extremist. I de-radicalized uh, almost 20 years ago. 
Um, I was part of a uh, organization called the Rolling Wood Skins, which was a offshoot of one of the largest national socialist or Nazi movements in the United States. Ryan Lowry shared with CBN about his former life as a prominent neo-Nazi with the goal of taking online hate groups mainstream. It's in every um, platform you go to. These recruiters, whether it's through jihadism or domestic terrorism, whatever it might be, they, they've adapted to and know where they need to be and how to find the most vulnerable people. In finding ways to finance his mission and move in the ranks, Lowry got into trouble with the law. While his life of crime ultimately led to prison, the time behind bars provided distance from his extremist group. Friends and family helped Lowry de-radicalize and ultimately rededicate his life to Jesus Christ. I was born and raised a Christian um, my whole life. I, I think that sometimes what happens is, is we, can, we can get tunnel visioned at times being Christians and not opening ourselves up to what other cultures are there and what other cultures do offer. I, I want it to be a shock to people. I want them to understand that um, you can be anybody. Nobody is untouchable from what these groups offer. For 10 years, Lowry has helped extremists find a new way to live through a counterterrorism effort called Parallel Networks. He says the only way to open those doors is through conversations and compassion. I looked at Jesus Christ and the way that he um, didn't go into churches to preach to the choir. He went out into areas where people were struggling, people that, you know, uh, adulterous, like Mary Magdalene and others. I'm a firm believer that humanity um, we're supposed to treat each other with peace and kindness and love. And, and, and this lack of empathy that we have in our communities um, is what's ultimately, I believe, tearing us apart. Unfortunately, technology combined with bad actors has torn the social fabric by trying to replace community with an online world. That's why Dr. Cowart wants to remind gamers and others that when things appear bad online or in life, they have the power to make a change. When things seem a little bit off, the other great thing about games and the internet is you can just switch to a different server or switch to a different game or mute that person or block that person. Um, you don't have to engage in conversations that make you feel uncomfortable. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, scripture tells us be vigilant and alert and be yeah. on guard. And you can see here's just another way we need to be so. Yeah, definitely. And I, I did just, just want to share, of course, there's darkness um, in uh, the gaming atmosphere, just like there's darkness everywhere, but there's also light. And uh, I had shared this, uh, I think, last week when I got back from this young adult retreat, but I actually met a couple and um, I asked them what, what they do. And they said that they're in digital ministry. And I was like, oh, well, what, I've never heard that before. what does yeah. that look like? And she goes, well, my husband is a Twitch gamer. So he games and he has a profile on Twitch. He has a pretty big following. Um, you can look him up. His name is Preacher Guy. That's his like Twitch name. But he is literally gaming and preaching the gospel at the same time. For, for those who don't know what Twitch yeah. is, can you give a real quick? Twitch you know? is basically like a social platform just specifically for okay. gamers. And I actually heard uh, my brother-in-law is a gamer and he was like, you don't even really have to be playing video games to be on Twitch. It's almost like a live radio show in a sense. Um, but most of the time people are playing games and you're commenting and that sort of thing. So p people can just comment whatever and ask questions. And you know, when you're on there for hours and people are asking you questions, he just started sharing the good news of the gospel, what he does for a living. He was a pastor. Hmm. And now this is his life. And he's become a Twitch partner, which is pretty, pretty massive. You have to have a certain amount of followers for that. And he literally has seen people come to his church, get baptized, born again. So things really awesome. They're things. giving him the freedom to express. <laughs> yeah. Christ-centered <laughs> messages and yes. really, yeah. I don't and, know why um, I'm surprised, but I am. Well, surprised. I mean, you know, God. I if he deals with any hate too. You know? Oh, I'm sure he does. Yeah. I'm sure he does. But you know, God can use these seemingly dark things for good, and He can really turn it around. And I, I witnessed that yeah. getting to know this guy and his wife and what they're doing. And he's so. seeing salvations, baptisms. He's seeing salvations and baptisms and people coming yeah. to Christ. So it's really good so news. There is some good stuff out yeah, there. And definitely. for stories like this that we should, of course, be vigilant about where your kids of could course. be at risk. I know, I got some teenagers in the house, and when they play video games, it's in our den where everybody is. I'm not saying that's a full proof, you know, method, yeah, but, but it's good when you got parents walking around the room. For sure. You're uh, like, hey, what's yeah. up? What's going on? I just have to remember sometimes I'm on mic without knowing it. They got the little thing. on <laughs> Well, Brooke Jones stole a gun and at first she wanted to sell it for drug money. Then she came up with a new plan. Use the gun to force the police to shoot her dead. My life's over, you know, in my mind. Who cares? I thought, if I go in here and rob this place, the police will come, they'll shoot me, that'll be it. 
Brooke Jones grew up in a busy home with a working mother and stepfather. The oldest of five children, Brooke longed for the attention and acceptance she needed. Her grandmother was the only one who gave it to her, but that meant going to her poker games where Brooke's life would take a turn. There was some creepy old man on the couch and um, I was supposed to be coloring and he was, you know, just fondling me. I didn't want to tell my grandma what was going on because I didn't want her to send me home. She was sexually assaulted two more times and still the now nine-year-old Brooke kept silent. Those incidents um, definitely shaped how I saw sex. I viewed it as a way to please other people or a way to fit in or for people to accept me. Making things more confusing, Brooke was enrolled in a Christian school at the time where she learned about Jesus and the Bible. I had that childlike faith and I believed all of the Bible stories that we read, I can recall um, as a child praying for things and believing that he was listening. That changed when she started going to public school at the age of 12. She quickly fell in with the wrong crowd, smoking weed, stealing, and having sex. Anything to get attention and be accepted. I wanted people to care about me. When I became exposed to this new crazy world, I jumped right in it. Then at 13, when her parents tried to discipline her, Brooke started running away. The police would bring her back, then the cycle would repeat. And that put me in the company of some really um, dangerous individuals. I'm 13, hanging around 18-year-old men, 20-year-old men, engaging in sexual behavior with them to buy my place to stay. And they're giving me alcohol, and they do other drugs, and so I'm doing other drugs. It was overnight that I was emotionally was just numb. For the next eight years, Brooke was in and out of her family's home. But when she stole money from her mother, she was kicked out of the house. By the time she was 23, she'd had four children and was trying to slow her drug use while raising them. That's when Brooke learned that her youngest sister, Jessica, the only family member she thought loved and accepted her, had heart failure and was going into surgery. Everybody was praying and I remember thinking, God was gonna answer that prayer. You know, he was definitely gonna <laughs> save my sister. But she didn't live. <laughs> Brooks slipped into a deep depression. After leaving her kids with family, she fell hard into drinking and doing cocaine. I just had hit my breaking point. You know, when you're on drugs like that, you're sick of yourself. I didn't want to live. I just well, didn't have the courage to kill myself, I guess. Strung out and using an unloaded handgun she'd stolen to sell for drug money, she began robbing stores, hoping the police would corner and shoot her dead. During one of the robberies, a bystander tackled Brooke and held her until the police came. She was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to 25 years now forcefully separated from her children, Brooke began to consider their future. I wanted to be back with my children. My kids suffered because of my decisions. I definitely wanted to get out and to be available for my kids, to be the stable parent figure that they needed. Brooke was given a life recovery Bible, and that's when she started reading the stories she'd heard as a little girl. I was ready to hear God because I was just as far down as I could go. I was reading the Bible. I was feeling peace. I was feeling God, you know, touching my life and touching my heart. She also began listening to Christian music. I felt Jesus speak to me through those lyrics. God reached me and was like, I can help you. I can change you. I prayed and said, you know, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna give my life to you and let's see what happens. Brooke started attending a Bible study in prison and continued to pray, grow her faith, and overcome her addictions. Then one day, after serving 11 years. They told me 
My sentence had been commuted and I was gonna go home. I was stunned. It was a miracle. You know, it was forgiveness that only God can give. Brooke received a full pardon from the governor of Kentucky. She immediately reconnected with her children, reconciled with her parents, and is now married to a Christian man. Brooke gives all the credit to God for restoring her life and for giving her the love and acceptance she always longed for. There was nothing I could do or muster up within myself to make those changes, to change my heart. God was the only way to my new life. I don't have to look for acceptance in anyone or anything. I have found love and acceptance from God. His forgiveness, His pardon is waiting for me every single day. I love that. You know, we share these stories with you guys to encourage you and to let you know if you haven't heard, the gospel transforms lives. It's as simple as that. And if you're in a place where Brooke was, and you are wanting a new life, but you just don't know how you could ever change. I pray and I hope that Brooke's story, that her testimony has just sparked hope in your heart right now, that through a relationship with your Savior, Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. It's a promise when you accept Jesus into your heart, when you surrender like Brooke did, when she said, God, I'm gonna give you a try. She's lost everything. She was in jail for years. She was given a Bible. She started reading the Bible. She started to experience peace and joy. And she realized the forgiveness of her sins and the new life that could be ahead of her if she just gave God a chance and she did and you see the outcome. She's reconciled with her four children. She's living a new life, a life that is free, free from the bondage of her past sin, drug abuse, sexual sin, whatever it is. I encourage you today to give God a chance just like Brooke did. Give him a chance today because I guarantee you that your life will change. You will begin to change from the inside out. Maybe your circumstances might not change immediately, but you, something inside of you will change. And it is freedom, it is peace, it is joy, it is restoration, it is redemption that your Savior gives you when you surrender. So surrender today. Pray this very simple prayer with me. I always like to say you don't have to be perfect to come to Jesus. Come as you are and He will do all of the rest. Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, Jesus, say his name out loud, Jesus, I surrender to you. I am done doing life my way. I need you and I want you. I want to be a new creation in you, Jesus. Transform my life. Renew the spirit inside of me. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind. Free me from this bondage of sin from this sinful life that I have been living. Today, Jesus, I choose to turn from my wicked ways, to renounce Satan and all of his ways, and to look to you, the author and the finisher of my faith, my savior, my redeemer, my Lord and my savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me and my sins and the sins of this world. Thank you, Jesus, that you resurrected three days later and that same resurrection power now lives in me as I declare with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are Lord forevermore from this point forward. In the name of Jesus, I pray and ask all of this. Amen and amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer with me, the best is yet to come for you. For you. And we have amazing free resources that we want to give you. You can give us a call. We can mail them out to you or we can send them to you digitally. Again, it is all for free. And we pray that these words from John encourage you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. God bless you. Hey everyone, I'm Ashley Key. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so we can reach more people with encouraging content like you just watched and so you never miss a beat. 
See you next time and God bless.